one of the key ingredients of being successful is you've got to like and care about people. So, and then be passionate about whatever you're doing. And I'm totally passionate about Kualoa and, and, and preserving it and the mission. He was midway through college when he asked his father if he could take over management of family-owned lands in Windward O'ahu. They were the site of a ranch just getting by after their heyday as a sugar plantation. What John Morgan did with those lands, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Kualoa Ranch in Windward O'ahu is an amazing property. It's actually three virtually intact ahupua'a, or Hawaiian mountain to sea districts. This precious property has been in the Kama'aina Morgan family for a long time, and at times after the fall of sugar cultivation as Hawaii's dominant industry, the family struggled to hold on to the lands to make them financially productive. When sixth generation Hawaii family member John Morgan grew up, the 4,000 acres were a private nature reserve and cattle ranch. He had no plan when he asked his father, as a college student, if he could manage the place. Over the years of his leadership, the lands took on a diverse new life. There's still some ranching, but the spread is best known as a destination for visitors and locals and filmmakers and TV shows. Parts of the blockbuster movie Jurassic Park were filmed here. But big time media makers don't come by every day. The way John Morgan explains it, Kualoa Ranch's main business is offering environmentally sustainable and educational activities. His great, great, great grandfather bought the first parcel of land that started Kualoa Ranch from King Kamehameha III. Our family got started here in 1828. Uh, Dr. Garrett P. Judd and his wife, Laura, came on the third ship with the missionaries. Uh, and uh, he was a doctor. He wanted to be a missionary, but they didn't accept him at the American Board of Foreign Missions. From what I understood, I read the book Dr. Judd, and I read it uh, a while ago. And, uh, and he, his theological, uh, theologic uh, credentials weren't good enough, according to the people who were evaluating him. Maybe he got a C instead of a B, I don't know. <laughs> but still he was appointed the mission doctor? Yeah, so, so they wanted doctors here because, as we all know, you know the the whole you know situation with uh, with disease all and illness. all of that, and, and it was just terrible. And so there's a, a lot of epidemics. In fact, we created a timeline, uh, you know, for early Hawaiian history, and you know, it, it, you know, we recorded all of these different epidemics uh, that were where there was quite a few epidemics and. So he, he dealt with it. Uh, he learned a little bit about the la'au lapa'au, you know, from, uh, from the Hawaiians. And he actually wrote uh, the first uh, anatomy book uh, in, in Hawaiian. And so they wanted doctors. And so kind of in the spirit of being a missionary, but, you know, uh, basically helping people out, uh, that's why he decided to come here. He practiced medicine for about 10 years before he uh, went into service for the king. Uh, so he got acquainted with the king and there was a mutual respect there and he wasn't a, a, a missionary and he wasn't a merchant and, and he was interested and he was a pretty you know, smart and, and uh, honest guy. So he ended up becoming a minister to King Kamehameha III. So in successive years, uh, he was minister of finance, a minister of foreign affairs and minister of the interior. Uh, not in that order, but so he held held pretty uh, big positions in the government. Do you think being a physician helped bring him to the king's attention? I, you know, honestly, I don't know. Uh, again, you know, the the population at the time, you had uh, missionaries who weren't really involved with secular affairs, and then you had merchants and whalers and others who had their own self-interest. And so here was a guy who. Um, Met a lot of the families through helping them yeah, and, with their and medical and issues. Didn't have you know kind of a, a, a self interest that, uh, so he was kind of a neutral, uh, a neutral party. But again, he was reading the books about him and everything that uh, that I have, and, and and a lot of people would agree that you know he was definitely a, a, a solid guy who who was devoted to the kingdom and the king. The start of the ranch was uh, in 1850. It was part of the king's personal land, and uh, and so he sold 
the, the, that parcel, parcel of land to Dr. Judd in, in 1850. Did Dr. Judd know what he was going to do with it? What we understand is that he, you know, just liked farming. He wanted to, you know, he just wanted his own farm. And uh, so I'm not sure, because there's no records of it, how much that he was aware of, you know, the cultural and historical significance of Kualoa. He, he, he did build a house out there and, and uh, you know, actually shipped schooner loads of squash and melon back to Honolulu. So he did actually run it as a farm. How uh, much did he pay for the land, do you know? I think it was thirteen hundred dollars for how many acres? Six hundred and twenty-two. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So that's was that's your great 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 yeah. grandfather. Yeah. I believe I've read that your that Dr. Judd had uh, chose to renounce his American citizenship to mm -hmm. serve the King of Hawaii, King Kamehameha the Third. Yes, he did. Record was the first one, so he was the second uh, American citizen to renounce his U.S. citizenship, and that was a it was a it was a telling. Uh, a telling act on his part, yeah. Does your family have an opinion of what happened during the overthrow times? Not really. Uh, Dr. Judd was gone already and, uh, and Charles was there. Charles was uh, in service to the king. He was a chamberlain to King Kalakaua and so all of our ancestry, you know, up to the point of the overthrow was definitely, uh, you know, in favor of the monarchy. Which of the generations was it who got involved heavily in sugar industry, which was king in Hawaii? So Dr. Judds had uh, nine kids, seven of which who lived at least to adulthood, and uh, one of those nine kids was Charles, and so that was my great-great-grandfather. And he actually went into business with Samuel Wilder, who was uh, his brother-in-law. He married uh, one of Dr. Judd's uh, daughters. And, uh, and um, as you're saying these names, I think of streets in Hawaii yeah, yeah, which yeah, bear yeah, these yeah. names. Yeah. So, so Samuel Wilder and Charles Judd uh, basically bought Kualoa from Dr. Judd and started the sugar uh, uh, mill in 1863, and it went bankrupt actually. And so, uh, Dr. Judd got the land back because they co they couldn't pay pay it all off, and uh, and and so, so that's how Charles got involved, and then Charles actually ended up buying the neighboring two Ahupua'a of uh, uh, Kaaava. And that was in 1860, and Hakipu in 1880. So by 1880, the the ranch was intact. Three, you know, separate it's, but it's, contiguous it's three Ahupua. Ahupua. Are they yeah. still intact? Uh, still intact and still contiguous. Yeah. So f f for all this time, since the days of the monarchy, um, your family had these three contiguous Ahupua mm -hmm. and kept them. I mean, that's, that's very unusual, isn't it, to, to not have to sell off land? It is. I mean, when you look at a lot of Kama'aina families who, you know, in order to preserve, they, you know, or whatever, for whatever reason. Whatever reason, sold, right. Yeah. And so during the Depression, that was a very tough time. And uh, um, uh, at that time, my great aunt was kind of in charge, and, and things were, 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 again, very tough. And, and that's when Ka'ava Town was created, and that was our way, that was our time when we sold land. We didn't sell it at the time. We just created lots in Ka'ava Town and leased them all out. Uh, um, but that was about the extent of that. And luckily, we didn't, we didn't do more. So, long-term uh, leases? Long-term leases. Are they, is the land still leased? Uh, nope. It's all sold off through, you know, through, uh, you know, the Land Reform Act, uh, you know, that uh, occurred in the 1970s. Uh, so, that all went to fee in, I think, uh, uh, 84. Uh, was that part of the Ahupua'a? That was part of the Ahupua'a. So, so yeah. a small section was sold a off? A little small section, uh, just kind of, and it was, it's cut off from the main part of uh, uh, Ka'ava Valley by a little ridge, and so it, it you know, didn't disrupt, uh, you know, other parts of the operation. And so that's why they chose to develop it over there. Well, what know? is the cultural significance of, of the, the Kualoa lands? It's mentioned in the Kumulipo, uh, you know, the, the name Kualoa. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, legendary reference uh, to, you know, Kualoa, whether it's Lua Nu'u, who was supposed to go and find a place for a sacrifice, or the legend of Mokoli'i, or uh, you know, there's a, there's there's just a number of different uh, legends. I wouldn't call it a legend that it was a, a training ground of chiefs, because when you go back to, you know, Kamakau or you know some of the other the writers who talk about uh, you know um, back in the time of Kahahana and Ka, uh, Kahekili, 
Uh, there was a, a, a kahuna, kaupulupulu, who, who was advocating that, uh, that, you know, kualo was so sacred that kahahana shouldn't give it to kahikili because kahikili actually was, was, was demanding it in order to keep peace. So I don't consider those as much legends as more recorded history, even though that was back in the 1700s. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of different reference to, uh, to how important Kualoa was in the ancient times. And for us, it's, uh, it's really important to honor that, understand that, and, and keep that uh, uh, as something that we still cherish. Managing Kualoa Ranch had never been a full-time job for any of John Morgan's ancestors. But with changing times, he felt driven to make the lands financially productive or risk losing the precious property. Except for a, a, a short time in your life when you went, you went to college, essentially you've lived at Kualoa at least part-time. I think your family, when you were a kid, went back we and were, forth yeah. to Nuuanu and, and, I mean, you, and Kualoa. So yeah. you've spent a lot of time as a, as a residence, a, at least a part-time residence at Kualoa all your life. All my life, yeah. You, know, you must know every little nook and cranny over there. I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, there's all these little valleys, and you know, I, I love my wife and I love to go hiking out there, and the and the kids, and and so. But you know, it's it's funny. It can be, it's a big place, but it's also a small place. And if you want to go to every single corner, it's going to take a lifetime. So, haven't been to every place yet. <laughs> Did you know you would become the CEO of the family <laughs> property Kualoa Ranch? No, <laughs> it's one of those things that, when you're young and there's only five employees, and you know, you know. Fixing fences, spraying you know, uh, you know, herbicide in the pastures, and you know, moving irrigation you know for the cornfields and everything. And, and you did and, all that. So we did all of that, and uh, take, uh, and then we we started horseback rides. You know, took out the horseback rides with my wife, and 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 you know, I asked my father if I could make a career at the ranch, and so. You know, when he said yes, I, I came back from uh, Oregon State University to University of Hawaii, but it's really just one foot in front of the other. There is no grandiose plan and, and uh, you know, certainly couldn't have envisioned Kualoa Ranch being what it is today way back then. Well, you know, when you said, when you asked your father, did you have a sense of it would continue to be horseback rides and, and beef? I definitely had a sense it would continue to be horseback rides and beef, but then there needed to be something else. And so, uh, you know, because it was clear that it wasn't sustainable. Uh, my grandmother, my great aunt, my father, my aunt and my uncle, who were all the older generation, uh, you know, knew that it wasn't a sustainable uh, business anymore. Uh, it never paid a dividend. Um, and so, so everybody always had other jobs. Everybody as always they had ran other the ranch. Job. Yeah, that is one of the things that we can credit um, my ancestors. Is nobody looked at it as a cash cow, and so everybody wanted to preserve it. But you know, if you're losing money every year, it's you know harder to to, to do that. And so um, when I uh, you know asked him if I could try to make a career there, I knew that it was I had to figure something out. But you were okay about figuring it out. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I guess I stepped up to the challenge. <laughs> when you came back from a couple of years of college at Oregon State mm -hmm. and decided to go to school in Hawaii and work on the ranch, you took a lot of credits, but they weren't necessarily, I think you took enough classes to get credits to graduate, but they weren't in the right they, yeah, areas yeah, yeah. because you were just picking what you thought you would need. You mm -hmm. knew what course you were going to take. That's right. So. Yeah, I was an economics major. I, I didn't really take college as seriously as I'm glad all my kids took it more seriously than I did. And um, so I applied to three colleges, chose Oregon because I didn't want to go to California or Colorado where I was uh, accepted to both other colleges. And I didn't know what I wanted to do when I first uh, went to college. So I thought economics was, you know, gives you a good understanding of, uh, of life. and, and uh, so. So I was a major in economics in Oregon State, and then when I transferred back to University of Hawaii, I stayed in that. But you're right, I, I took finance and I took accounting and uh, horticulture and agronomy and Hawaiian language and all the different things that I thought might help me because you know I had already made the decision and, and my father had supported it that I'd make a career at the ranch. And, and I'm glad I took all of those things because now when you read financial reports or 
I love, uh, you know, uh, knowing, certainly not fluent in Hawaiian, but, uh, you know, I, I, I know a little bit. And uh, so all of those things have helped me tremendously. Did you have an inkling of what you'd want to do? I did. Uh, knew that, you know, people coming to the ranch and tourism, tourism. was probably the answer. And so, but what would they look at? Uh, at the time, you know, again, 1981, when I took over, didn't know, but by 84, you know, kind of, I'd met a whole bunch of people in Waikiki and, and, uh, and realized that tourism was booming and especially the Japanese tourist uh, part of the business was booming. And uh, so when we opened what we called uh, the Activity Club at the time, 1985, on April, April 1st, 1985, uh, we had put together a variety of different activities, horses, ATVs, uh, jet skis, helicopters, a gun range, all these different activities and, uh, and, and we present it to the Japanese uh, uh, travel wholesalers. So we had one type of client, which is the Japanese travel wholesaler. The consumer was the you know, Japanese customer. Uh, and then we had all of these activities and, uh, and, and, and so we launched and it was a very, you know, started off slow, but it really resonated with the marketplace. So by the end of the 80s, we're, we're doing gangbusters and, and uh, you know, I thought I was a genius. <laughs> and that was before the movie productions came in. Yeah, we had a couple of small ones. Uh, I think the original Hawaii Five O had come out there and early 80s Magnum PI had come out there, but really before anything big had started, yeah, yeah. For example, 51st Dates, King Kong, Skull Island, and Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. Under John Morgan's leadership, Kualoa Ranch was thriving as a visitor destination. But world events and economic changes during the 1990s and early 2000s made him rethink his business model. And then everything changes. Uh, you know, in the, in the early 90s, I think the Gulf War is in 91, and, and, and you know, there was a currency crisis in the, in the, in the East. And, you know, just a bunch of different things happened and, and uh, you know, a lot of other uh, businesses were saying, hey, this Japanese business looks good. And, and so it started to really uh, struggle. Uh, and so by the late 90s, it was struggling. And then, of course, 2001, it was a, was a terrible situation for everybody. So we had to kind of relook at what we we're doing and, and, and and, and you know, it wasn't all in one fell swoop, but uh, uh, so, but we introspected, looked and in, and in, in tried to figure out really what was the strength of the of the the ranch and what was our core competency and you know whether it was from a cultural perspective or or you know market uh, driven. We realized that it was really the land and the history and the culture and and uh, and, and the agriculture. So. We got rid of a lot of the stuff that didn't really fit with uh, the brand that we wanted to build. So we got rid of the gun range, got rid of the jet skis, got rid of the helicopters, got rid of a lot of the different things and, and focused on ways that people could just experience the land. We recognized that uh, in order to be able to sustain the land, you know, we have to have a viable business. and so tourism and, and local, local visitors as, uh, as well, it's not just tourists. So how do, we, how do we provide enriching experiences for people and get them close to the land, and, you know, introduce them to agriculture, uh, introduce them to the Hawaiian culture, and, and of course the movie part is, doesn't hurt either. But, um, so as time goes on, we try to, try to you know, enhance you know, different parts of the land by you know, doing different things, whether it's cultural or, you know, agricultural or otherwise. And so we're kind of in a perpetual landscape improvement mode. <laughs> so right now we're resurrecting taro patches in a bunch of different areas and, and uh, so that when people go through these areas, you go, wow, this, this is gorgeous. And you, you learn about it. And, uh, and then not only that, you know, we, we harvest uh, the crops and so, and then we built a replica. It's not a heiau because, you know, it's, it's new, but we built a replica of that. We have several different areas that um, yeah, we're doing different things from a, from a cultural perspective. We're doing things, you know, a lot of our agricultural developments occurring around the tour routes. We built a 6,000 square foot piggery made out of a repurposed movie set. It's right on one of the tour routes because 
people like that kind of stuff. So whether it's a culture or the agriculture or you know other things, we we know that integrating tourism uh, with what we do and the history of the place is, is is what makes us successful. You're basically not near the city center. You're you're not near the legislature, which could be making laws that would you know that mm -hmm. would affect you. Um, that it's kind of a, a really different life, isn't it? I mean, the skills you need to, to do well on the land you own and also, you know, what it takes to keep that land in a, in a modern American city. Yeah, you know, I hate to use the analogy of the plantation era, but, you know, plantation era is not all bad, you know, because people were taking care of the land and, and, and maybe monoculture cropping is, is not what everybody likes now, but from uh, from the standpoint of being there and not in Bishop Street, so to speak, and, and you know being close to people and being close to the land, uh, you know I, I really I really appreciate that. Uh, I do get to town, uh, you know, whenever you need to. But uh, but I'm I'm fortunate, and and even our our salespeople are fortunate that that we're at a point now that instead of having to go drum up business a lot of times people will come to us and so a measure of success is when 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 you know you don't have to go to town to go to to, to do everything and uh, and we can stay out there and do our work and attract the right kind of people what so. do you worry about what keeps you up at night when it comes to running a ranch and and uh, and this uh, this uh, robust uh, visitor operation yeah. Obviously, you worry about you know the the people. I mean, we have almost 400 employees, and and uh, you know they're a, they're a big responsibility, and and you know we want to take care of them. We, we want to uh, you know see if we can have more of a, a of a positive impact in our community. We're a big company in a small community. They, those things don't really keep me up at night, but um, but they are parts of the responsibility that are that are important. Um, uh, you know. Again, from that perspective, we certainly hope that uh, that the visitor industry in Hawaii remains robust. Uh, because if it wasn't, you know, it hurts everybody, including our company. We know that as we evolve, we need to, you know, put more effort into different areas. Five years ago, we hired a, created a position for a Hawaiian cultural resources manager. So that person is just devoted to. You know, encouraging and in, uh, all of the you know awareness and and, uh, and learning about uh, Hawaiian culture within employees as well as guests. Now the same thing is going to happen with uh, sustainability, just to push the envelope a little further, push the needle you know a little. And what kind of sustainability will that person look at? Uh, everything, um, but we're not all that good on energy right now. Uh, you know, we don't want to do a better job in recycling, but you know, it's really how do we integrate all thoughts and, and, and uh, of sustainability into all the different diverse things that we have going on because we're really diverse. So, so, so that's kind of a direction. Uh, you know, we don't see, you know, major changes in the, in the, in the short term. We just hired another, another agriculture manager at uh, the same time. He's going through training this week and, and so we're adopting a new um, kind of approach to our agriculture. We used to say, this is diversified ag, this is livestock, this is aquaculture, and now we're doing it more from a kind of a kuleana perspective of this 40 acres is your kuleana and has taro, you know, shrimp and, you know, lettuce and everything else, and you run this, this area. And so we have three diversified ag hubs that we call them. One of them's about 40 acres, one of them's about 60 acres, and another one in lower Ka'ava. So, that's with the piggery and the sheep and the chickens and the and cacao and all kinds of stuff. Cacao so, too. So we have cacao and bananas and papayas and all kinds of all kinds of things. And it all adds up to sustainability. You have a succession plan for you? Nope. <laughs> you don't. Not yet. No. Yeah. Does any of your children want it? Everybody uh, is definitely interested in. in being involved, and, and uh, so our whole family. We're so lucky that you know it's it's my brother, my sister, and I, and, and we have some cousins uh, that are involved uh, in, on the ownership side, and everybody is uh, is passionate about the preservation of it, and uh, everybody uh, is 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 committed. And uh, but from a succession point of view, it's there's that's still a work in progress. Is it, as they say, complicated? It's it's. 
It's complicated. I mean, uh, you know, being involved is is, is one thing. Uh, being the CEO is a whole other thing. And so, so we're we're really grateful that everybody wants to be involved. But I think everybody realizes that uh, from a succession point of view and a CEO, it, it, the best person should do it. It's not whether it's family or not. And so, yep. so we're in that process of trying to figure out. Uh, I think I still have 10 more years or something, so we'll see. Mahalo to John Morgan of Nu'uanu in Honolulu for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Nui. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of an adventure thrill seeker if you're talking about the personal side. You know, some friends and I climbed the top of Mount Rainier. I didn't think that was really a risk. Uh, it was very strenuous, uh, you know, but, um, you know, surf big waves. If you're comfortable doing it, uh, you know, um, did the Molokai crossing with a couple of friends and, and a relay on stand-up paddle boards. It's, it's a challenge. So, uh, on the personal side, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't really think about things as monumental risks, and maybe I'm forgetting things right now. And, and on, the, <laughs> on the business side, I mean, every, every time you do anything, it's a risk. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org.